Senator McKim has submitted a proposal under Standing Order 75 today. It is shown at item 13 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? I note the required number of senators are standing. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers into debate, today's debate. With the concurrence of the senator, I ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. I call Senator Cox. Thank you, Deputy Pre President. Um, well, here we have a government who wants to host a climate conference on one hand, but actively giving billions of, bro of dollars to projects that will wreck our climate on the other. In fact, you can't have it both ways. This government cannot attend COP27, claiming they're back, like the saviours that they think they are, whilst campaigning for donations from their fossil fuel mates and giving public money back to them. During my time at COP27 just two weeks ago, I heard about the impacts of climate change that we're already having, particularly of our Pacific Island neighbours who want to also co-host COP31 with the Australian government. I heard about the costs of, to, that local communities are facing now, the impacts on the culture and the traditional way of life. First Nations people are being displaced, leaving their ancestral homes because of climate change. Climate change is real and climate change is here. The climate science spells it out clearly. We must say no to new fossil fuels and no to public money being given to these fossil fuel projects for expansion or the opening of new ones. The Greens will continue to push the government further and faster to be more ambitious in their climate commitments. Now, Vanuatu's climate minister is asking the Australian government to do the same before they'll agree to co-host COP31 alongside them. It seems like a reasonable ask, would you not say, but we know that the government struggles when made to choose between their strong climate action commitment and lining the pockets of corporate donors in the fossil fuel industry. The $9.1 billion in the budget for gas and petrochemical plants in Middle Arm Harbour was alongside the $42.7 billion in fossil fuel subsidies. Middle Arm, just like many other projects the government is throwing money at, is a dirty fossil fuel project that does not deserve public money. Middle Arm is estimated to increase the Northern Territory's emissions by 70 and increase industrial air pollution by 500 per cent. Middle Arm will just sit three kilometres away from Palmerston, where mo locals will have to breathe in the air toxins produced by this precinct. The project will destroy our climate, our environment, but also impact on the health of those living in this area. The Beedaloo and the Barossa gas projects will also be uh, used to power this gas and petrochemical hub at Middle Arm. Public money for Middle Arm feeding into the public money for Beedaloo and Barossa, and these projects all depend on each other. And just last week, we saw the Resources Minister jetting off to Japan and assuring foreign investors that their investment in Australia's fossil fuel industry is good and is a welcome investment. So thanks to her for doing that on our behalf. While the Australian government loves to give away money to billionaires, much of this investment in the fossil fuel projects comes from overseas investors such as Japan and South Korea. If only the government could commit to phasing out fossil fuels and putting the equivalent of that $40 billion into renewable energy and infrastructure, that we need to build a clean, green energy grid. The government has a very important decision to make, and we think it's an easy decision and indeed a decision that should be made the second they won the election. The Greens want to stand in solidarity with Vanuatu and all of our Pacific nations for that. For years, they have been sounding alarms and begging the Australian government to take climate action seriously and take the action that is necessary and required. The social licence for fossil fuels is disappearing and disappearing fast. This government can no longer justify their subsidies to their giant corporation mates whilst wanting our Pacific neighbours to support our bid to host a climate conference. Now, in COP27, I also heard not just from our Pacific neighbours but also those of the Torres Strait Islands. 
those that I've also spoken about in this chamber, and the alarming, alarming rates that at our low-lying islands are disappearing. And we need to take that seriously. Our domestic policy that Minister Wong talked about today is just as important as supporting our neighbours in the Pacific. Thank you. Senator Grogan. Thank you. Um, we will be voting against this motion, um, but I want to make clear why we will be doing that. The Minister for Climate Change and Energy has just returned from a very successful COP27 in Egypt, in which Australia was warmly welcomed back into the fold, into the international community as a climate change leader after nine very long years of neglect. We are delighted to join with our Pacific family in bidding to co-host COP31 in 2026. We want the Pacific to have a voice, and there is no better way than hosting this conference with them in our region for the Pacific to put their case before the world. We look forward to working closely and cooperatively with the Pacific to secure and deliver a COP that will actually look to a collective vision in this important environment. Minister Bowen met with the Vanuatu climate minister at COP, and that minister has described having an Australian government with a strong agenda as a breath of fresh air. The level of support that we have received from around the world has been really, really encouraging for this bid, including very strong support from the Pacific region. But we also acknowledge that nations have differing positions which are rightly debated at these international summits. The question that we have in front of us refers to the Middle Arms Sustainable Development Precinct. The government is supporting the development of the Middle Arms Sustainable Development Precinct together with regional logistics hubs along key transport links. This investment will enable the precinct to be globally competitive and sustainable with a focus on green hydrogen and critical minerals processing. This investment is not a subsidy for fossil, fossil fuel. So just to be clear, this investment is not a subsidy for fossil fuel. Rather, the funding will go towards infrastructure that will support users to export clean energy critical to meet our commitment to net zero. Not only green hydrogen, but also the manufacture and export of lithium batteries that are critical to global energy transition and decarbonisation. Demand is growing overseas for these clean energy sources, and this investment will help to position the Northern Territory and Northern Australia to diversify their economy and take advantage of new opportunities and provide significant economic benefits and sustainable jobs. Middle Arm is already recognised as a potential site for renewable energy, with companies like Sun Cable looking to establish renewable energy battery facilities at Middle Arm. Instead of funding any particular companies, what we are seeking to do here is invest in common use enabling infrastructure, like the Marine Works, which will give all potential users in the market an opportunity to grow and thrive including those who are able to process and export green hydrogen and energy transition components. There is some way to go until the construction commences, and as um, our friends would be well aware, the project is undergoing significant <coughs> environmental assessments, both under the Northern Territory Environmental Protection Act and also under the Federal Environment Protection and Biodiversity and Conservation Act. These assessments will look clearly at the impact of the proposed construction. The Australian government will work with the Northern Territory government, with the industry, the local community and the relevant First Nation communities to develop a sustainable growth plan for Middle Arm. With a view to further announcements next year on the implementation of this equity investment. The Australian government believes investing in projects such as the Middle Arm precinct are indeed an important way of setting up our economy and the Northern Territory for a sustainable future. We are committed to playing a constructive role as a climate change leader 
and we also support economic and job opportunities where it makes sense to do so. And we do believe that this project has potential for both the economic development and the job opportunities for the Northern Territory, as well as helping us into a sustainable future. Thank you. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, well, uh, this motion is a reflection of uh, the complete failure of the Greens to get anything right on energy and also uh, the complete embarrassment uh, that was uh, COP27 uh, for the Greens' political platform. Uh, quite clearly, uh, over the last couple of weeks, there's been no agreement uh, among the countries of the world uh, to uh, get rid of, phase down, whatever you want to call it, fossil fuels. Indeed, the, the, uh, the headline in The Guardian uh, online paper was the COP27 agreement fails to call for phase down of all fossil fuels. Uh, the Greens here now with this motion are trying to sneak in uh, to this chamber uh, a decision that wasn't taken even at the climate conference. So, of course, why should Australia uh, do something that other countries are not committed to do? And the reason that other countries are moving away from phasing down fossil fuels, the language in the COP agreement is, is more open to fossil fuel development than the one last year at Glasgow, the reason that's happening is the rest of the world has woken up that we need, <laughs> we need coal and gas and oil uh, to have a functioning modern economy, indeed, to, to, to feed ourselves. And I, I think one thing that must be stressed in this debate is that in a few months' time, indeed by the end of this year, uh, Australia will no longer produce uh, urea-based fertilisers. Uh, urea fertilisers are the most common used fertilisers in Australia. Uh, synthetic nitrogen fertiliser, of which urea is one, are the most common used in the world. In fact, uh, nitrogen-based fertilisers feed uh, around half the world's population uh, right now. Nitrogen-based fertilisers, synthetic nitrogen-based fertilisers, come from natural gas. If we didn't have natural gas, if we don't produce natural gas, we won't be able to feed half the world's population. That's how the world works. That's how the real facts work, and the rest of the world has found that out over the past year when Russian gas was denied uh, to European manufacturers. They've had huge issues with producing fertilisers, sent fertiliser prices through the roof right across the world, We've sent food prices up, fed into uh, inflation, as we've seen right around the world, causing untold suffering, especially in poorer countries. But here in Australia, it is a travesty that we are not or no longer will produce urea fertilisers. We'll be reliant on the Middle East. We used to be reliant on China, but they banned the export of them a few years ago. Uh, we'll be reliant on the Middle East uh, for, to grow our food rather than taking care of it ourselves. Now, we, have, we have plenty of gas resources in this country. Uh, we are just denying uh, ourselves the use of them. We're not supporting them. Uh, uh, this, this new government has uh, scrapped uh, funding for the development and exploration of new gas basins in the Beetaloo uh, uh, and, uh, and the uh, Cooper basins. Uh, we need to let's get back to supporting our country and our people. And, and just like the rest of the world has worked out that you actually do need fossil fuels, not just to make things, Order. but also uh, to do the very simple things in life like feed oneself. Order on my right. The other thing that uh, this motion demonstrates is how, how wrong the Greens have been on energy over the past few years. I remember, uh, I'm old enough to remember a few years ago, uh, uh, Green senators would be in this place saying there's no market for coal, there's no future for it, no one's going to make any money out of it anymore. Uh, and that was their prediction. There was a prediction there would be no business case uh, to invest uh, in fossil fuels. But now, of course, they have to. They've been wrong on that, and fantastically wrong. And now they're trying to use uh, the laws to ban people from investing in these projects, to stop them, even though there is a very strong economic case for Australia to invest in coal and oil and gas. You just have to look at our trade data, because people might not realise, but over the last 12 months, King Coal has re-emerged. King Coal has been re-coronated. It is the nation's biggest export once again. Uh, the biggest export from Australia over the past 12 months is coal. It's overtaken iron ore in the last couple of months. For the last 12 months, we exported $130 billion worth of coal. It alone is about a quarter of our exports. So about one in every four dollars of exports from our nation, merchandise exports, I should say, comes from coal. Iron ore is about $120 billion, very important. Gas, though, gas too, is uh, sitting just shy of $80 billion now. And together, coal and gas and oil account for 40 per cent of our nation's merchandise exports. Uh, 
uh, a massive amount of wealth for our country and indicative of how much demand there is for our high-quality fossil fuel production in Australia. In that environment, we should be increasing our production of those commodities, because when the price of something goes up, when demand goes up, we should respond to that and help the world, especially overcome aggression from Russia, to help the free world provide for its own food and energy needs by increasing our fossil fuel production. This Greens motion would make us weaker and more dependent on dictatorial regimes who, who mean to do us harm. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. As mentioned earlier, COP27 came to a close overnight with really little achieved in terms of reducing emissions. Australia played a more positive role than we have previously, which some would argue would not be hard, but we still rank ninth last out of 65 countries on the Climate Change Performance Index. This is a long way from the climate leadership spoken of by the government. Uh, continuing to subsidise the fossil fuel industry will only make things worse. Giving money to the profitable industry responsible for global warming, given what we know about the, the state of, of the climate, makes no sense. And funding of the Middle Arm project is particularly bad. The government has committed $1.9 billion to fund, as we've, we've heard, uh, common use infrastructure, which we are assured will be sustainable. <coughs> Senator Grogan says that uh, this is not a fossil fuel subsidy, but in estimates we're told that it's up to the market to decide, and uh, the NT government and private companies are openly talking about using it for fossil fuels such as gas. If this proposal looks like a petrochemical plant, uh, has the government ducking and weaving on whether it is a petrochemical plant and has the support of the gas industry, then it most definitely seems to be a petro petrochemical plant. Uh, at estimates last week, the week before, I asked the department what cost-benefit analysis has been done for this project. They weren't able to, to answer, so we still don't know. Um, how we can justify this $1.9 billion spend. I also asked uh, if they were aware that the, the site chosen for Middle Arm, uh, according to modelling done by the CSIR and the IPCC, uh, will be underwater by 2100. They weren't aware of that either. So while it's great to hear about the environmental impact assessments that will be undertaken, we're missing the whole point here around climate change. And I think Senator Canavan highlighted that uh, in his speech, talking about the need to continue to invest because it's profitable. With climate change, whether or not it's profitable is be beside the point. Is it morally right to continue doing what we're doing, given what we know about climate change? Not just given what we know, given what we're seeing, the flooding across the country, the, the droughts in the Horn of Africa. We, we've heard uh, people in, in Parliament argue against loss and damage for people who live in countries who have contributed next to nothing to this issue, who are pleading with us to show some leadership. Finally, we have a government who is saying the right things who are saying we're going to become leaders on climate. We're not seeing that yet. We're going to give them the benefit of the doubt and hope that we, we continue to see them heading in the right direction. But $1.9 billion for a fossil fuel project is not heading in that, in that direction, in the direction that Australians want and that, is, that millions of Australians voted for. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, Vanuatu is calling out Australia on our nonsense. And uh, it's clearly said, well, Australia shouldn't host or co-host the next climate conference if we are giving public money to open up new coal, oil and gas projects. And I completely agree with the Vanuatu climate minister on that. And I thought that this government had made a commitment that there wouldn't be any new public money 
for fossil fuel subsidies. But unfortunately, when the budget was handed down, we saw some tweaks, sure, but we saw about $40 billion of the last government's fossil fuel subsidies retained by this government, who are so poor they can't put dental or mental health care um, into Medicare, they can't raise the rate of job seeker. They're too poor to do that, but they're not too poor to keep $40 billion of the last government's subsidies for the coal and gas industry. And then they have the audacity to add $1.9 billion for a new gas export terminal without the consent of First Nations owners, I, might, I hesitate and am desperately sad to see, $1.9 billion for an LNG export terminal and petrochemical hub. Now, we just heard from Labor that, oh, look, it might do some other things as well. Don't, don't look too hard. Well, I'm afraid it is directly a gas export terminal that will prop up gas uh, extraction from the Beetaloo Basin, that the $50 million public grant fund uh, which was proposed by the last government is also being retained by this government. So this is a gas export terminal that will essentially create a market for the Beetaloo uh, gas basin, which also lacks First Nations consent and which would be an absolute carbon bomb. So I'm afraid so much for no fossil fuel subsidies and so much for being too poor to fund decent things in this country, not too poor to give yet more handouts to the gas companies that conveniently make large donations to both political uh, parties. The other thing that made me laugh cry was the Labor Party saying that this was a uh, sustainable development precinct and not to worry because it's going to be assessed under the EPBC Act, our federal environment laws. Well, I am an environmental lawyer, and I can tell you that there are no climate impacts considered under the EPBC Act, because we do not yet have a climate trigger. So I'm afraid it gives me no comfort whatsoever that a gas export terminal will need tick off from our current EPBC laws, which were written by former Prime Minister John Howard, because the climate impacts won't be considered. So I mean, honestly, you could not make this stuff up. We're at $42.7 billion now of public money over the Ford estimates over four years going to prop up the fossil fuel sector. $42.7 billion over four years. That is an absolute outrage from a government that said there wouldn't be any new public money for new coal, oil and gas, and from that same government who are crying poor when it comes to actually helping people with the cost of living doing things like increasing the pathetically low rate of job seeker which sees people kept below the poverty line. It doesn't add up, except when you look at the donations from the coal, oil and gas industry. And uh, of course they only have to disclose that once a year on the 1st of February. So it's just a very cosy little stitch up here and it's no wonder that Vanuatu's climate minister is calling Australia out and urging us to not have new fossil fuel subsidies if Australia wants to host the next climate conference. The Greens are firmly in agreement with that position. Those fossil fuel subsidies should have been dumped from the budget. There certainly should, have been, uh, should not have been $1.7 billion added for a new gas export terminal. And The Labor government need to start remembering that they'd one time made a commitment that not to have new fossil fuel subsidies, and they ought to stick to that commitment. Senator Roberts. Thank you. Great news. Vanuatu still exists. Experts told us it would now be underwater due to global warming and rising sea levels. Just like Al Gore forecast Mount Kilimanjaro would have no snow by 2016. How many islands has Vanuatu lost due to rising sea levels? None. Mount Kilimanjaro is still topped with icy white powder. Maybe that's why it's now called climate change instead of global warming. I thank the Australian Greens for this breaking news that Vanuatu's climate minister would only back Australia's bid to host the 2026 Conference of Parties COP, if Australia does not commit to any new coal or gas projects. With that headline, the solution is clear. Australia must immediately fund and build as many coal and gas projects as humanly possible. So there's no chance these parasites will, will be hosted here the expensive UN World Economic Forum talk fest for climate elites, the 2026 COP. What's the COP? The UN's conference of parties involves millionaires, billionaires and politicians bouncing around the world in fuel-guzzling private jets to luxurious locations, gorging themselves on prime beef while preaching to we lowly peasants to reduce our carbon dioxide footprint, stop flying, stop driving and stop eating red meat. If the 2026 COP was hosted in Australia, taxpayers would be forking out for the UN's globalist elite talk fest. 
We'd be paying for them to tell us to destroy our energy grid and commit economic suicide to appease the sun gods. If COP, the Conference of Parties, does not want to come to Australia, that's their loss. That is their loss. We'll keep our abundant protein-rich red meat, delicious range of seafood, cheap and reliable coal-fired power, huge gas reserves and efficient petrol and diesel cars. Let the UN's Conference of Parties, the World Economic Forum's Conference of Parties, eat their bugs in the dark while waiting for their electric vehicles to charge. We have one flag, we are one community, we are one nation. Senator Ormond Payne. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The 22 2022 federal election saw a groundswell of support for candidates that support reducing Australia's emissions. Not only is the public support there for reducing emissions, it's also the necessary thing to do if we want to avoid further catastrophic climate change. So Australia hosting a conference of parties meeting, or COP, to work together globally to prevent a mass extinction should be a good thing. But hosting an international climate change conference is a not-so-cheap exercise in public relations if you're committed to opening up more coal and gas mines like this government is. You can't have climate action while opening up more coal and gas. They are literally incompatible. Vanuatu is absolutely correct to put conditions on their support for Australia's bid to host the COP. The government likes to talk about regaining our place on the international stage and how our partnerships with the Pacific are about respecting the Pacific family. Well, using island nations to greenwash Labor's fossil fuel agenda is a pretty atrocious way of showing respect to the Pacific. Pacific nations know this, and they aren't going to let it happen. They have proven themselves more than adept at lobbying richer and more powerful nations on climate policy, and they will continue to make decisions in the best interests of their people and their region. If Labor were serious about climate action, they would put a stop to all new coal and gas mines, stop using public money to subsidise the fossil fuel sector, and commit to phasing out fossil fuel use and exports. We need to transition to a clean energy future. Giving $1.9 billion to a new petrochemical and LNG facility undermines our interests in the Pacific, it undermines Australia's credibility and, quite frankly, it undermines our chances of keeping global temperatures to a survivable level. Thank you. So the question is that the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Yeah. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
the doors. So the question is that the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes. Senator Cadell's teller for the noes.
order. There being 13 ayes and 28 noes, the question is resolved in the negative.